All right. So welcome everyone. And, uh, it's nice to see you all today. Welcome to live from my drum room and without any further delay or ado, please welcome my very dear and old friend, the legendary Tristan Bowden. Hey, <laughs> all right. How are we're, you, we're, Johnny? I'm great, Tris. I'm great, buddy. It's so great to see you. And we're just, we're like on time. I, you, you got me, you were so early for the sound check. You inspired me to be on time with this thing. So <laughs> uh, who says rock ain't pretty, right? <laughs> and, and has to always be late. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh man. Look at that wall behind you. Have you, have you oh. been in any famous bands or anything? Have you ever like, <laughs> oh. have you been in <laughs> I, I got to say, you you know, I, I really feel like the luckiest guy in the world because of the people I've gotten to work with and the songwriters and the songs I got to to play on and the producers I got to work with. I mean, I still am pinching myself. You know, when I was a kid and listening to the radio and I always had my ear glued, I never in my wildest dreams ever thought I'd be able to hear myself on the radio, you know? And, yeah. Uh, I never get tired of it. I got to tell you, <laughs> I never have. That's, that's so great, man. What a great, what a great, you know, outlook on it all. You know, it's, it's to see you all these years later, every bit is like, as long as I've known you, Trist, this enthusiastic and, and, and uh, positive and all that energy, man, it's so great to see it. Oh man. Love it. Thank you. It, it really is an inspiration. And I, I got to say, when you said that, you know, you don't get tired of it. I was going to make a joke and say, man, some of the songs you've played on, you could get tired. They've played so much. I mean, <laughs> how many times have we heard Footloose or, you know, I mean, and I mean that in a good way, oh. it, you know, number one hit. <laughs> oh, shoot, man. Well, that's a funny story. And I've told this story many times about that song. We didn't like it. <laughs> because... Uh, well, well, I jump. I don't know what you want to talk about first, but no, the, we're just going to go. Yeah. Okay. Well, Kenny is is to his credit, but also to sometimes our painful, uh, <laughs> like, but, but whatever. Anyway, he <laughs> loves to to rehearse, and he's a perfectionist, and so uh, on the road sound checks were not really sound checks they were rehearsals and two hours long and it's still that way to this day you know oh, wow. i mean when i yeah. left chicago and went back to kenny for a year it was i thought mistakenly it would have changed some uh-uh <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway kenny knew that that he had this song that was going to be in the in this movie coming up but had no idea it was going to blow up like it did but uh, at the band at that time was Nathan East on bass and Buzzy Feeton on guitar and Neil oh, Lars on keyboards yeah. and Steve, a great band, you know. And uh, so uh, true to form, he had us uh, rehearsing hours on this song. And so we knew that song inside and out, every nook and cranny of it. And uh, so when we got off the road, we went into the record plant and we cut it in one take. Nathan East says it was one take. I think wow. it was two. I think the first one was for sound and the second one was the, the actual take. And uh, and I remember walking out of the studio. In fact, Kenny talks about it in his book because I reminded him uh, that Nate and I were sort of with our arms around each other. And said, That's the last time we'll ever have to hear that piece of crap again. <laughs> <laughs> and then it blew up number one all over the world at the same time and i gotta say back to hearing yourself on the radio when i couldn't like change a channel and not hear that song oh, yeah. i, 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 I know. liked it a whole lot better <laughs> <laughs> oh that's that what a great i didn't i didn't know that backstory and, oh, you and didn't uh, know good. no and and i just remember like you know the break you the break in the middle with they Simmons pads or? yeah they were Simmons yeah. and you were at Simmons I think that the, um, I, maybe during that time yeah just a little after that and and that's when I that's when I met you was eighty five and I think I was you know I would jump we'll jump around but the first time I met you was uh, you came in and and uh, there was a guy working there that you would remember I think his name is Bill Threlkeld. he worked for yes. Pearl. 
Yeah, yeah remember Bill? Of and course. and yeah, and you were a pearl artist at the time, and and he introduced us, and you were like this, exactly the way you are now. This like gregarious, happy. Oh, oh man, great to meet you. You know, and oh. and I'm like. Oh, Tristan Bowden. Wow. You know, and, and, uh, yeah, I, anyway, that, that I always loved what you played on that song. Like, it's just so grooving, so great. So oh, tasty. Man. Thank you. Well, we, you know, we cut it with, uh, with acoustic drums first. And then of course, Simmons being like sort of the thing, you know, back then, yeah. uh, Kenny thought it'd be a good idea to overdub Simmons on it. And it was a gr great idea. It was a perfect thing. And I'd already worked out that drum pattern during those two hour rehearsals, you know, <laughs> months, you know, <laughs> so I knew, oh. I knew uh, what to play, you know, what I played on the acoustic. So it's a combination of the acoustic drums and Simmons on that drum. Yeah. Down. Yeah. It's, it sounds great. It's it's timeless too. You know, you hear it. You still hear it today on satellite radio, and it's it's timeless. It really is. It's, I'm I'm blown away that I got to be a part of music history in that way. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and and when you when you guys so you so you guys had rehearsed it and knew it cold when you went in to record it. It wasn't like a yeah. a thing you worked out in the studio. Kenny, like you said, he just you yeah. probably yeah. Yeah. Uh, Although, geez, you know, that that uh, the bass part that Nathan East played is so phenomenal. And I'm pretty sure that was what he played on that that first or second take. Uh, but an interesting aside yet again about that song is we played it live aid. Right. And yeah. we only played that one song and we we flew in uh after having done a show in Houston the night before, and I couldn't bring my drums. So gratefully, Stan Lynch loaned me his acoustic drums, and I only brought my Simmons, right? So uh, so we could approximate that sound or, or the record. And uh, Oh, dig it. But Eric Clapton was standing on the side of the stage and heard us play, because, uh, of course, he played at, at Live Aid too. And so the story goes, uh, he was so enamored with the bass playing on that thing that he asked Nathan to join the uh, like shortly thereafter. And yeah, yeah. Nathan left Kenny. It was to play with Eric, and uh, so wow. So he's been. I didn't realize he's been playing with Eric that long because I've seen him with Eric at, like in the you know in the nineties and in the two thousands, but it goes all the way back to like 85 or late eighties. Yeah. Basically. I'll pay, I'll pay, wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. Uh, yeah. I believe it was, I'm trying to, oh, well, live aid was what year it must've been 85. Was it 85? Because it was yeah. about the yeah. time Footloose came out. I think it was 84, 85. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and jumping back a little before that, let's not forget I'm all right, which was my i guess my introduction to you i knew who kenny was uh -huh. but that that song made me like i think for a lot of drummers just like stand up and go like take notice of who's this guy playing drums on this song and oh. that's another great you know man. groove and tune man thank you you know i i've got to say that that uh that tune george hawkins the bass player and i uh really kind of were trying to approximate and get the essence of that Mick Fleetwood, John McVie thing, you know, oh, yeah. yeah. and, and we had actually the first year I was with Kenny, we were on the road during the rumors tour opening for Fleetwood Mac. And so we'd become friends with them. And that's how that whole, whenever I call you friend with Stevie Nicks and, and Kenny, that's how yeah. it came to be. Uh, okay. But on uh, uh, it wasn't long after that we cut uh, that that song for Caddyshack, and so uh, so we we loved Fleetwood Mac and the, and that feel you know that thing that they have you know so, absolutely so, yeah so, uh, that yeah wow that's great I I had no idea and and uh, and that song was written for the movie it was a song that like was Kenny Tap to write a song yes. It was okay. Yeah, and lyrically, if um, when you see the lyrics in front of you, it kind of makes sense too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it does relate loosely to some parts of the movie, you know. So okay, I, I guess I never stopped to really think that, you know. I just I, you never know if like if 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 they heard it and said this would be great for the movie, or if they actually said like we want you to 
write this for the movie. So yeah, yeah, yeah he was yeah. sort of like uh, commissioned, if you will. <laughs> Dig it. Okay. Like, and did you guys? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, did you guys think it would be the hit that it that song became? I mean, that was a massive hit too. No idea. No idea whatsoever. Yeah. And what was interesting was I think it it, it uh, actually the soundtrack to the movie. Uh, the the film company, whichever one it was, wanted to maintain the rights to the soundtrack uh, yeah. version. So th that version of I'm All Right, we couldn't release as our own single. So uh, the management, we actually had done an, a record called Alive uh, with Kent yeah. Loggins. And we performed that song. And I sang the bridge on it. Uh, <laughs> oh man yeah that actually on the record was sung by eddie money right yes yeah and, uh, but bruce bodnick the guy that produced uh, the the uh, the record i'm all right or or actually the live album said man he sounds more like eddie money than anybody because when he died, <laughs> I, I smoked you know a lot and i had <laughs> gruff voice you know, so. oh my god oh this is great man this is some really inside shit we're getting here today this is great uh, <laughs> all right uh, man. well but, can i can i can i ask like a, a geeky gear question if i can please i i always love the sound of your toms on i'm all right especially i mean they're just so big and fat do you remember what kit you were using in those days absolutely and i'll tell you who the engineer was and where we did it great and everything yeah. yeah it was actually uh, a set of Tama uh, superstars, you know, wow. double-headed ones, because I'd been using yep. the Tama concert toms before that. It's the first set I'd got from them. But that was my first endorsement, was actually Tama. And uh, so uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful wood kit. And uh, we had set up in this brand new uh, room at a and that they had built that was all like like marble, and glass oh and, yeah and uh but you could could kind of pull the curtains on the mirrors to tailor how much splash there was in the room you know or make it greater or less and yeah it was andy johns the oh. great late andy johns who was the engineer so man i mean i hit my snare drum when it went skank and I thought, are you sure? Are you sure about this, Andy? And he went, trust me. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh. So the drums, when we were cutting, it just sounded, God, they were so blurry. And I mean, you know, that I was going, wow, I hope this turns out okay. But then on the record, there's none of that, you know, when you wow. do the record. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, he, he, um, and what an amazing engineer. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Did, did he... Did he mic the drums? Were they mic'd more sort of live? Like like you say, it was a, like a live room. So did he have, was it you know, like an mic overhead? They, yeah, yeah. He did yeah. some of that and some close micing too. And some and close Much mic. like his brother, right? Or, or yeah. Yeah, yeah, Glenn, Glenn yeah. Who sort of pioneered all of that. Whom I got to work with him too, with Crosby, Stills, and Nash much later, you know. But yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I really got to see firsthand that whole Glenn John's thing, you know, that, that worked so well for the Stones and Bonham and everybody. And, uh, yeah, man. What a, I know, what a concept. And it, it, uh, you know, the, the, the sound is just like, like you say, the, the, the idea of, of miking that way seems so maybe unorthodox, but the result is amazing. Yes. You know? And it was so yeah. counter uh, the thinking of the day because it used back then, you know, we'd throw a mattress on the, you know, <laughs> in the seventies anyway, on yeah. The, yeah. for a while on the Tom Toms and the snare. <laughs> I mean, it may as well have been a mattress because it was so thuddy, you know, in the early seventies yeah. anyway. And uh, wow. it had to be real tight. You know, right, miking, no ambience, you know. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Well, man, there's so many folks watching, Tris. I just want to read a couple of quick comments and sure. and questions. Um, John Ferraro, our good friend, is oh, watching. I love Tris. Is, I love John, too. He said, Tris is my mentor. Oh. Uh, love you both. That's beautiful. And and uh, Anthony Cusina has a question. I'm going to just uh, jump in with this question before it disappears from the feed. Uh Tris, would you please talk about some early game-changing moments in your career 
when you felt confident in your record and your recording capability? Oh, okay. Well, gee, uh, that's a great question. Yeah, he asked I'm, a question. I'm still not that confident in my in my recording <laughs> ability. Uh, you know, it's like I think you know you have to have a giant microscope, and and to to really be able to zero in on the parts of your playing that you don't think are are translating, you know, to to tape or to digital information or whatever. And so it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, that very thing that that makes you uncomfortable about your playing is what pushes you forward and and uh, forces you to improve upon it. So, so in answer to the question, I uh, when I after the band Honk, the first band I was in that really had a record deal, I yeah. hated everything I'd I'd played on record with them. I I couldn't listen to it. I, but anyway, I moved to L.A. and back then you could you could actually make a living, kind of eke out a living doing publishing demos for publishing music publishing companies. So I was like, you know, for Warner Chapel and for all these different you know publishing companies, I was doing all these songwriter demos. So I was in the studio so much that I didn't have time to critique myself too much. And then I realized finally, listening to playbacks, hey, that sounds pretty good. You know? wow. yeah <laughs> so, so it was right about that time that i was going well i guess i'm all right i'm i'm okay as a as a session guy you know and yeah uh, but i'll tell you when when i really when i really started feeling feeling more confident was when we had cut this is it for kenny loggins and michael mcdonald uh loggins song that actually yeah. won a grammy uh, and I had stolen so heavily from Steve Gadd and <laughs> Ferraro will attest to the fact that he actually showed me the hi-hat pattern that he had gotten from a, a, a tune that Gadd had done with Chick. And so I took that, I changed one note and made it my own. So yeah. it's a steal, steal from the best. <laughs> we we all do it i mean people have stolen from you so yeah oh, man. yeah I'm come on flattered. but but anyway yeah johnny knows that story and there i've confessed i feel so much better <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's that's great and i and i was going to mention that song i didn't realize it had won a grammy though i, I know remember it was a huge hit yeah for kenny also yeah. this is it yeah yeah Wow. And, and, and that, and, and that, what a run. And when you were playing with Kenny, you, as you say, I mean, during the eighties, you were really, you were like wearing two hats, Kenny's drummer, but a session guy too. You were doing a lot of other records during that time. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. Gratefully. Yeah. I hooked up with David Foster, uh, through Kenny, uh, through working with Kenny and, and David liked my playing and, and boy, once you're in his stable, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, he was working with every and still does, you know, I mean, my God, the guy. So I, I, uh, I'm really grateful for, for having had that association, you know, with, with David and all the records I got to do, uh, through him. And, and, and I, you know, I, I was just looking today too, just looking at some of the things you've done, um, you know, like during that period when you were playing with Kenny and you were doing sessions and you played with Bill Champlin, you played on a Bill Champlin record mm -hmm. and a Peter Cetera record. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't put it together that you had been working, you know, David Foster and that connection. Is that what kind of led to the Chicago when that seat opened up? Well, you know, the Chicago thing was actually at, at, at the behest of Bill Champlin. Bill, I whom I'd done many sessions with uh, previously, and I'd been a huge fan of, my God, all the way back to the Sons of Champlin. Um, mm -hmm. He, they were sitting around throwing names around about, you know, who, well, who could we get? <laughs> and uh, and Bill said that he was going, you know what, we're forgetting somebody. And he went, Tris. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I still remember the, the moment uh, I was living uh, in a home with, my girlfriend and and uh, George Hawkins, the great bass player from Kenny Loggins and his girlfriend in North Hollywood. And I I get this, or actually George gets this call from Bill Champlin. 
And over the course of the conversation, Bill asks, asks George, hey, have you talked to Tris lately? And he said, <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, he's right here. <laughs> and I gave me the oh, phone man. and Bill said, what are you doing this summer? And I had just gotten off the road with Al Jarreau and, yeah. and Kenny. I'd spent the better part of a year splitting my time with Jarreau and Kenny. And uh, I said, funny you should mention uh, that because it was the first year in years. I didn't have a summer tour lined up. And uh, and I said, I'm not doing anything. And he said, well, how would you like to play with a band? And I went, <laughs> <laughs> Let me think about it. Yes, of course. <laughs> so, uh, so, wow. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's how that all went down. Wow, man. I, I remember I 19 summer of 1990. I remember it like yesterday. And uh, and did you know at the time that it was going to be as as permanent as it became like almost 30 years? Or was it like, oh, I had no idea. I mean, yeah. I I knew the incredible legacy, my God, and the importance yeah. of the band. I mean, it was uh, it was already, I mean, way beyond iconic. It was a sure. piece of Americana and something all of us could be so proud of was, you know, this incredible band, American band Chicago that incorporated horns and rock and roll. And, and you know, my God, Danny Surf and it influenced us all. I mean, I I listened to him ad nauseum, you know. I I I love yeah. him so much, and loved the band, and I'd seen them live, you know, when I was 16 years old, and they were had just come to L.A., and uh, so I had no idea that the legs that the band has yeah. <laughs> would, in fact, happen, you know, and uh, and that the band would. Now they're celebrating 55 years. I think I was there for the 50th, you know. <laughs> amazing yeah. i know i know so, i just yeah, yeah i i remember when it when it when you when you joined the band and i and i just didn't know if maybe you know you were going to just see how it went or they were going to you know how see how it went and oh. and uh, i i i guess but i guess i saw you that first summer and and you you know all love and respect for danny because danny's danny but you came in so seamlessly and so oh. effortlessly and and made the music feel so great and sound so great Thank and, you. and yeah and you made it your own too i mean which couldn't have been an easy thing to come in and oh. and play those parts and make them your own you know well i tell you that thank you johnny so much for that but uh it was difficult for me to not try to play all of what danny played um uh, but but they made it apparent from the first rehearsal they said look don't feel like you have to play danny's parts try to make it your own if you want and it was like okay yeah so i did i i, I did and, yeah. and and no two players playing exactly the same notes are going to sound exactly alike as we all know but uh, a lot of the things that i tried uh that were mine <laughs> i went back and went you know, that's, it's like trying to put tits on a fish. It, yeah. it didn't work, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what Danny had played was so perfect for those songs. And it was as important to the song as the horn chart was, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I found myself as the years wore on, I was going further and further back to trying to play what Danny had played, you know? I, I remember that. I remember us talking about that at a gig once. And you, and cause I, I think afterward I said, wow, you played, you know, it was like whatever, whether it was make me smile or something. Uh -huh. And you said, bro, you know, it's like, that was like the perfect thing. And, and you know, you, to play something different just for the sake of playing something different, it's, yeah. you know, it's, and that's so true. It's like, it's the, the analogy you made is so perfect, Tristan, that like, it'd be like the horn players trying to change their horn part. Yeah. Yeah. wouldn't have, wouldn't have fit right you know i'm and, glad you yeah i'm glad you agreed yeah because uh, yeah, yeah yeah it just it, it wasn't the right thing to do and yeah and, uh, good god danny seraphin was just so brilliant is so brilliant and uh you know played so brilliantly on those records and uh, i'm i'm was honored to be able to try to reproduce them <laughs> yeah well no you you absolutely did and and uh, i 
I used to every summer enjoyed coming out to see you and mm. um, all the different, you know, uh, the different tours that you guys would do, whether it was sometimes you'd be with the Beach Boys or mm. Earth, Wind and Fire or, or Huey Lewis. And I, I got to remember, I got to I was reminded of this. Oh. Um, and I, I must have been living under a rock because I didn't know this at the time. But there was one summer you guys were out with Huey Lewis mm -hmm. and they went on before you guys. It was up in at the uh, the shed along on the water in Boston that you guys played a million times. The Oh, yeah. Uh, Harbor, the Lights. pavilion okay. Harbor Lights. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. And so during Huey's set, he introduces you. You come out and start playing harmonica. <laughs> and I had no idea. I'm like, oh, yeah. And, and not only were you playing harmonica, you were playing it like a total badass, like a guy that like grew up playing the, I'm going like, where have I been? And then afterward I said to you, and you, and you were in typical Tris humble fashion, like, well, yeah, I, you know, I, I've been playing since, you know, honk or whatever. And uh, I, I play a little bit or something like that. I'm like, play a little bit, man. You are awesome. Oh man. Well, thank you, man. I've, I've loved, the blues, you know, since since my teens, I, and got and actually got introduced to playing harp. Of course, I mean the whole English British invasion, you know, sure, the Stones yeah. or, or uh, you know playing harp, and you know everybody seemed to to do it. But then when I heard the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, that was it. I was like, whoa, I love this. And uh, as a result of listening to Paul Butterfield. Uh, I, I started delving deeper into the, the the origins and the Chicago blues, you know, guys like Little Walter and uh, Junior Wells and, yeah, you know, yeah. James Cotton and all these absolute monsters. Uh, that's what really, really opened my eyes. And and uh, so I try to, you know, imitate, you know, some of them. And, and uh, but by the time uh, we were on the road with Huey, uh, it was Champlin that had told Huey, "Hey, you got to hear Tress play." And it was like, <laughs> uh, "No, I uh, do I have to?" Because like Huey, he's a monster hard player, man. I'm, yeah, he <laughs> is. He is. Yeah. And so he said, "So he said, well, play a little." He gave me a harp, and and so I did. And he went, "Man, you can play." So he said, "You're coming out on bad is bad." And that's so, it. Yeah. And I was like, "What?" And he said, "No, you're on stage with us on our encore." So I go, ah! so I, I went out there and he sure enough he had a great like twin fender twin amp tweed amp and a bullet mic and a harp for me and he said we're gonna trade fours and I was like well be gentle please you, know? <laughs> you hung with him Tris I remember you hung with him and I'm I had this giant smile on my face going like how did I not know this like I I totally you know and it's not like you would be somebody that would brag about it and say you know i play i play a pretty bad harp you know pretty mean harmonica but it was so cool it was so fun oh bro yeah. thank you man <laughs> oh, thank that was well i still can pinch myself when i think about you know having played harp on the on the wide screen right with <laughs> <laughs> with huey lewis you know <laughs> oh man too much well some more lots more questions flying in here i'm gonna um okay just read you a couple here from folks um Oh, Sandy Ficka says hello to both of us. Hi, oh, Sandy. Firefall. You know Sandy? Yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah. Great guy. Great guy. Sure, and a great drummer. And Firefall is a great band. And I'm... Yeah. 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 <laughs> you've been... And you've been... We'll, we'll talk about that. I made a note because you've been working with them recently, right? You've been doing some... A little... A, a couple tracks. Yeah. For this new project great. that's coming up. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Sandy's a... Yeah. Great drummer. Great guy. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, Russell Badaline is asking, um, no, he's just saying you're a huge inspiration. Sorry, not a question. He just, he loves your playing. All Thank right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank here's, a, here's a good question from Brad Arnold asking, what was the very first Chicago rehearsal like? Oh, That's good, wow. Good question. A really good question. Well, you know, um, I got that call from Bill Champlin the day before I was leaving for Peru with my then girlfriend, who was a singer and choreographer. And we had both recorded with this Peruvian artist who was big down there and yeah. uh, who was flying us down there to do a, a video, music video in Lima. <laughs> and oh, so wow. 
I, you know, we'd been planning for a couple of weeks to do this, but I knew I had to get back, right, to start rehearsals with Chicago. So it was the most surreal time. It was like, you know, I'm I'm flying on this plane with headphones going, good God, trying to learn, you know, their their show and thinking, I'm going to be the drummer of Chicago. My God, man. So anyway, I didn't sleep much while I was down there. I just shedded and shedded and shedded in my head, you know, yeah, getting yeah. All, the, all the tunes right. So by the time we got back, I knew their show. Uh, we were only down there, I think, maybe a, a week max. And uh, by the time we got got back, I was pretty confident. I knew all the arrangements. And so when when the first rehearsal happened, man, it was seamless. It was seamless. It, it actually went so well. I'm I'm so grateful to say that uh, everybody was going, yeah, this is going to work. So uh, great. And I remember yeah. Walt Perizader telling me, boy, it sure, I like the way you drive the bus, you know? <laughs> Man, that's, yeah. And, and Jason <laughs> said, I'm ready to go out and perform tonight. So I, I said, well, I guess I passed the audition, you know? So. That's some high marks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And when you when you were learning all these tunes, just were you like transcribing anything? Were you, were you or is it just, just storing it up and... In, in, in your head or were you that's the way i like to do it unless i yeah. have to like get paper and you know i mean some some gigs or you you just have to but the fact yeah. that i was a fan already and so so many of the the songs in the show were hits i mean it's like they're all part of all of our dna you know <laughs> you yeah can't yep. get them. so yeah it was just that's endings and you know some transitions and stuff you know that i, I had to to really learn that's a good point you're right i mean so many of those songs you know are, are so ingrained without even knowing it probably you you know you you don't even realize how well you know these tunes until you probably sat down and went oh yeah i know what's coming now and yeah. like you said endings and maybe some transitions but yeah it's gonna go here and then it's gonna go there and right and and you guys for for the most part play the tunes pretty faithful in terms of the arrangements right to the records it was Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much, uh, yeah, yeah. We didn't, yeah, we didn't really take, and as the years went by, it didn't really change much uh, yeah. in the way of arrangements and that. Yeah. yeah. Whereas Kenny would change them daily. <laughs> 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 that sound. <good. laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's just, I've heard these stories. Chris, when Chris Rallis was playing with Kenny, yeah. Uh, when it, you know, during the time you were in Chicago, Chris is an old buddy of mine from the Simmons days. And, right. and I, I remember him telling me these stories and he came to visit me one time at Zildjian and got a call from Kenny. I think we were having lunch and to come on to the venue because they were going to rehearse at like three in the afternoon or something like that. Or, uh -huh. you know, right. Yeah. So, sound it was, yeah, check. sound check. Yeah. <laughs> sound check. It, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, too funny. Too, too funny. Yeah. Um, oh, man. So, you know, and John Farrar is talking about um, Honk, and I, I would love for you to maybe just talk about that band a little bit because, you know, I, I feel like it was, you guys were sort of like a, a unsung heroes at the time, for lack of a better Well, you know, phrase. i got to say, yeah, I am so grateful for having been a part of that band because, number one, I mean, we formed – Right after I, I graduated from high school, I was a young guy in the band, and, and yeah. uh, I I had been I'd seen the bass player on TV over the years on everything from Lloyd Thaxton to Ninth Street West, all these television shows because <laughs> he was a part of of like New Life, which had a record, you know, when I was growing up, and and uh, I mean. Uh, and then Steve Wood, whom I'd I'd met hitchhiking, <laughs> and instantly <laughs> with the with the harp, I'd started. He had a harp on his dashboard, and I started playing. That's when we met, and he liked my harp playing. And then found out I wow. played drums too. But we just kind of hit it off. And then as uh, as time went up, they were both in the same band that that uh, that was really popular in the Newport Beach area and actually Orange County, and so yeah. They the the band they were planning on leaving and starting a new band and they they'd heard me play with a high school band that I was in, and uh, I was so flattered they asked me to be a part of this and we started as a quartet and then blew up into you know a sextet with the with Beth Fouché singing uh, vocals and and the horn player uh, Craig Bueller anyway 
we spent again so much time in the studio doing our own uh songwriting demos as well as as recording a couple of albums and uh had three different record deals and so ended up at epic records and that and and man you know we were there at the troubadour man when the eagles were being formed we were yeah. there i mean you know i met janice joplin i got to you know all, all of that we were right in the center of it and i'm happy to say that we were really respected by musicians and so so even though we imploded or exploded <laughs> whatever happened yeah yeah we we kind of had this respect so by the time i moved to la you know people kind of in the business knew who i was and so i started getting called for this and that you know yeah and uh and now when i go back and and revisit some of those recordings that we did that i said that i couldn't listen to you know i go god dang that's all right you know i mean the songs oh. were so good and and the drumming wasn't that, that bad either i was just so uh uncomfortable recording you know because it was so critical you know myself. well I'm, I'm glad you said that i'm glad to hear that i was hoping you would say that 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 now you know all these years later you it's you, you can listen almost with fresh ears and go man you know yeah i i know exactly i mean i'm I, at a much lower level i i know what you're saying tris i'm i'm so critical of when i hear myself i go oh my god that sounds awful but yeah. you know sometimes a little time can you know give you a little more perspective and 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 so I could I I can I find these records on iTunes? Could I, are they available oh, to download? Yeah, not necessarily iTunes, but uh, well, uh, I do know. Yeah, there's there there was a release, you know, Rhino Records, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. Well, there there was one that was started by the Universal Group, I believe. That uh, it was called Hippo Select, and so they actually made a compilation of of honks some uh, honks uh second album which was on 20th century Al uh, records yeah and and then an album that was going to come out on 20th century records that didn't come out and so it's it's about 30 tunes or so and you can find that on spotify if you great it's it just takes a while you know but then, okay there was a great great album that we did for epic that the great producer Henry Louis that produced Joni Mitchell and uh, with the LA Express, you know, Tom Scott yeah. behind her and, and all that, uh, that produced an album for us for Epic Records that you can't get, darn it. Uh, and then there was a soundtrack movie that we just celebrated uh, 50, 50th year anniversary of the surf movie five summer stories which is yeah yeah that was the first hit record i ever played on because we had a number one hit in hawaii and and uh you know being a surfer myself man it was like that was beyond my wildest too you know to, to it has to be yeah and, well <laughs> and and that and that band like led you to meeting all these people that you would collaborate with in the future, right? You guys opened for the beach boys and yes. And, and yeah. Jackson Brown and, and Loggins and Messina coincidence. Loggins. And, yeah. And Chicago. And we opened and, at Balboa stadium as did Santana for, for Chicago. They were the headliner. And so, wow. yeah. So I, it was almost prophetic in a way, you know, but yeah, I'm so, that's good. what I was yeah. Yeah, I was just grateful that I was around during that period, man, because it was such a formative period for, you know, for rock and roll history. And I was kind of there, even if on the a bit on the fringe, I was sort of there, you know, so. Absolutely. No, I you absolutely were there. And I was going to say when you, when you said that, that, you know, the Eagle, you're at the Troubadour with the Eagles. There were so many great bands like you guys that, you know, it's and it's still, as we know, happens today where like there's great bands out there that just for whatever reason the timing the you know the the politics at the label whatever it is it's just that they don't happen they don't get the attention right right when, when other bands do and uh, and what a what a great thing for you to be part of that whole scene to, to be able to say i was there when all that happened is it's pretty amazing that's pretty amazing i know I mean, yeah. i've really led a blessed life i really have and i know it yeah, yeah. Well, man, I, yeah, it, there's, there's a, a bunch more questions and I'm going to just, okay. um, John Rogers is asking, uh, oh, asking about you sitting in with Toto. Yeah. 
oh. uh, a story about you playing and Jeff handed Trish the sticks and said, get on the drums. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. How that happened was I was with Al Jarreau, which is a whole chapter of my life unto itself that, that I yeah. would love to tell you about sometime too. Uh, man, what, what an experience that was. But we, we were uh, in Germany at the same time that Toto was, and this was 1987, I believe. And, and, uh, and Jeff and I, of course, had been friends for years. And uh, so we were staying in the same hotel and playing the same hall, only on opposite nights. And so, oh, dig it. so yeah, so uh, uh, anyway, uh, Jeff and, and Steve and everybody came to see the Giroux Band uh, the first night. And I got, David Sanborn was opening for us and Dennis Chambers was his drummer then. So I got, oh. I got to introduce Jeff to to uh dennis but I'm just i will never forget the look on on jeff's face watching dennis chambers and <laughs> looking at me oh, you know <laughs> it was like <laughs> the first time you see dennis chambers yeah and, and the hundredth first time yeah it's that same you go yeah <laughs> yeah i <laughs> know i know i had to follow him for a whole european tour man you know oh. with Jerome, man oh my god and solo too you know so, oh geez man but uh <laughs> anyway uh uh jeff after that night you know and we we played and he said hey well you you're coming to see us tomorrow night right and i said of course and he said bring your stick buddy you're sitting in and it's like what and he said yeah. <laughs> And so sure, sure enough, I show up uh, early to the to the gig and he talks the whole thing down. We're going to pull a switch mid song on hold the line. Right. And so I'm going to start playing the hi hat, sneak out on stage, start playing the hi hat. And while he's still playing kick and snare, he's going to get up. I'm going to plop down in the throne and hopefully oh. it'll be seamless. Right. We did it. <laughs> I'm sure you did, man. We wow. Did. And nobody, nobody was the wiser in the band until Luke looked up and went, what? And he came right <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> it was so fun. God, it was oh, so my. funny. And I got to play another tune with them too, you know, uh, during the encore. And I, yeah, I got, I, I was standing in the shadows. It was a, I think it was, well, it was a Motown tune, but I'm trying yeah. to remember exactly which one it was. But, oh, what a what oh. a moment. And I've got a picture of it. They didn't even allow cameras in there. But somebody that was up by the stage took a picture of me with Jeff right next to me. Jeff was playing tambourine. And uh, he's kind of kneeling down, you know, like next to the hi -hat. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know that I can show you uh, right now. No, that's okay. But I, I, I've heard this story. It's so great to get the details, the the whole, the whole full story. Because, wow, yeah. I'll bet it, I'll bet it blew their minds to just look over and there you are playing. You know, oh uh, man, well, uh, more than anything, I thought, my God, if I fooled the band into thinking I, you know, that I didn't jolt them with a different feel, you know, than Jeff, because I loved his playing so much. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> then yeah. I, then I did it right, you know. <laughs> did you play those little bass drum triplet things yeah, too? Yeah, yeah, of yeah. Of course, yeah. I can't uh, do it anymore, though. In my old age, I can't. <laughs> those, those fast twitch muscles just ain't there, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man, what a great story. What a great story. Oh, man. This is uh, Jerry. Jerry Jack says, saw you in Portland, Oregon at a clinic. Must have been the early 90s. Uh, your girlfriend was belly dancing next to you while you were playing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that would have been Cecilia. Cecilia, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, oh, yep. I know about that Zildjian uh, video that she's on too with Alex Acuna because he's Peruvian and she was. Big. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I somewhere, Tris, I found the photo. I think I sent it to you years ago that Marco Sicoli sent me of us at when you did a Zildjian day for us in New York City. Oh yeah. And we went to Marco was working at Sam Ash. Right. And this the, this was 1990. I remember the year. Yeah. And 
we were probably a little naughty in those days because he was passing around the grappa. Uh, yes. Do you remember that? I sure do. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yeah. He took a there's a picture of, of you and me and Sean Pelton and Marco and the late great Mike Morris. Rest oh, his soul. Man, I know. Yeah. I yeah. yeah. I know, yeah. I know. But I it just it brought a big smile to my face because I'm like and I, I sent it to Sean too, Sean Pelton. Oh. He was like, Whoa, you know, look at this. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what great days man i think i, know, I, I just I yesterday got over that hangover from the grappa though <laughs> 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 that's got some hang time that's the oh one. <laughs> oh my god i know i know i, I those days are way behind me anything oh, like yeah, that me I'd, too. <laughs> oh my god i know i know i I'd, I'd, I'd go and see marco and that would be the first thing he'd whip out would be the, the grappa like, marco it's two in the afternoon <laughs> my god I know, what are you doing i know hey, uh, where is marco now he you know he was working for uh he worked for Vic Firth, as you know, and then he went yeah. to go work for D'Addario. Uh -huh. And now I think he's like a freelance guy. I think he's doing some stuff for uh, this. A uh, friend of mine has a company called Meat Hook, which uh -huh. is this app. Do you know about this app where you can meet musicians, drummers? And... I've heard about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. And I'll put you in touch with Anthony. And I think Marco's helping him oh, cool. sort of, you know, get artists signed on to it. And Great. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Cool. Yeah. Marco's a good, he's a, he's you know, a good guy. What a good, good guy, man. man. I know. I love it. Oh man. <laughs> well, I, I I'm going to run a couple more questions okay, by you. I'm sorry. I keep getting this. No, no, this is great, man. I, 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 I love that we can just, you and I could reminisce all day and, um, <laughs> and I want to thank you again for being here. And I want to tell everybody watching just how much I love you so much. And just oh, man. man, friends for 40 years and, uh, and, <laughs> Yeah, Love what a treasure. I, I got <laughs> This was, I'll never forget the day this arrived. Ah. This would have been, it says 1997, so I'm thinking 25 years ago. Yeah. And you, you sent me the Chicago Greatest Hits uh -huh. gold record. And uh, oh, man, I. Man, well, from my treasure. heart, man, I was so, so proud to have been associated with, with you and with Zildjian and with all the, but you in particular, bro. <laughs> I mean, you just, thank you over the years, my God, you've always had my back and, and championed me to any company. And my God, I'm so grateful, man. That record, we actually had a thank you, number buddy. one hit on, uh, even though it's a compilation of them, there was a number one AC hit called here in my heart. That uh, right. that Bill Champlin sang, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, so that was right, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. And I remember when I I called you to thank you, and you were, you like, you you said something like, I've been wanting to, I've been wanting to send you, I, I, or something. You you were just waiting to send it, or something like that, Johnny. I I, yeah. you know, been waiting to send you this, and I wanted to make sure, you know, I had the when it was gold, I wanted to send it to you, and I was so happy, just oh, so oh, appreciative. Oh, thank man. you. Oh, thank you. God. It's the least that you do. <laughs> well, thanks, buddy. And so a couple more questions came in through uh, Facebook. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, from Dean Foster. And he's asking, so this is a gear question. Hopefully um, mm -hmm. it'll make sense to you. Could you tell us why you decided to change to F note drums? Oh. And when are you coming to Oklahoma on Kenny's final tour? Oh, okay. Well, um, and it's Dean. Is that his name? Dean. Yeah. Dean yeah. Foster. Yeah. Hey, Dean. Thanks for the question. Uh, actually, I, I changed electronic drums, my choice of electronic drums uh, from, well, the other guys, you know, the big guys uh, yeah. <laughs> to, to F note uh, because I was so taken by the feel uh, by, by the sounds, by the fact you could, record like with one USB cord into a MacBook Pro, eight channels of MIDI audio drums. I mean, it was wow. just that simple. It was incredible sounds, man. And and uh, and the way they look, they, I mean, they're just beautiful to look at as well. And, uh, but I by no means have stopped playing DW drums. My God, that's my go-to. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. There is just no finer in my mind acoustic drum, and I've I've been with them thirty five years now, 
and uh, right. I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say you you are one of the original guys. I I remember. Well, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm honored to be that. You know, I I love those guys, and I would have played them before, but they they were such a mom and pop company. You know, in the when they first started out, it was just John yeah. and and Don. You know, working out of the garage. So. <laughs> Yeah, but boy, did they blow up, man. And they sure did, yeah. They yeah. changed no, the I, world. <laughs> they really did. They really did. They really did. Um, you know, Don likes to kid me and say that when I, I worked for him, for Don, you know, for three years from 86 to 89, and he said, yeah, as soon as you left, business just took off. Oh. You know? <laughs> he said it was the, the oh, best thing man. I ever... He said the best thing you ever did was leave because our business went through the roof. <laughs> you were the, the kiss of life. <laughs> yeah. You know, Don, he loves to, he loves to wind you up. He's, he's, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, oh, yeah. hilarious. Well, that's a great, thank you for answering Dean's question. And Roy Brown, uh -huh. not Roy Brown, the bass player, I don't think. Uh -huh. uh, but you, uh -huh. you've mentioned George Hawkins a number of times and he's asking, uh, George Hawkins, rest in peace, is one of my favorite bass players. You and George were like a great rhythm, were such a great rhythm section. Can you talk a bit about what it was like working with him? Oh, man. Great question. God, yeah. Great question. Thank you for that question. That man, in addition to being one of the one of the finest human beings and maybe the funniest human I've ever known on planet Earth or to ever take a breath. I mean, that guy's sense of humor was just off the hook. But as a musician, I've got to say, I learned more in the time I, I, I had the privilege of playing with him than, than maybe ever. I mean, about in terms of, of composing a rhythm track and, and yet at the same time, never losing sight of supporting the melody and the singer, only complimenting always only complimenting but creating a rhythm track that can stand up on its own it's a composition you know yeah. the, the bass and drum track you know it's interesting it changes uh like section to section and uh, i mean he just he that was a natural thing for george he just always did that i mean i remember first hearing celebrate me home which was kenny's first album solo album uh and there was no kenny loggins band yet you know he had taken mm -hmm. george from from loggins and messina and vince and john the two horn players but but uh you know it was gad and and harvey mason on drums and and you know bob james and the cats man in new york yeah and sure and uh and man this bass player just jumped out at me. I was like, who the hell is that, man? I mean, my God, I've never heard anything so musical. And it was George Hawkins. And I'd, I'd never met him until, until the audition for that tour, for the Celebrate Me Home tour, which en ended up being, uh, the we were the support act for uh, Fleetwood Mac on the Rumors tour. And man, I tell you, from the first bar playing with George Hawkins, it was so easy you know i mean you know how when you play with somebody you just yeah. you agree man i mean it says wham you know the yeah. one yep. was just there i was like midded man <laughs> nary a flam ever you know <laughs> that's man and, yeah that's magic that is just magic when that happens oh god and it was like that man throughout the, the years we played and even you know when uh, sinister forces were at work and keeping us apart, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, whatever the musical situation, you know, when he left Kenny and I stayed with Kenny and he went on to play with Jero, but not when I was there. And then I played with, you know, we always laughed at it. It was like, how did this, how did this that happen? Um, it was, it, it was like years would go by and we'd play again and it would, the same thing would happen, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. He's one of my That's, best friends I've ever had in my life and one of the finest humans I've ever known. Uh, I hope that answers the question. That's that's a great that's and and that's a great what a great answer and a, and a great question for him to ask and did did you, would you say that the reason you guys connected the way you did as a rhythm section I mean did you I mean it was it is a 
kind of a simple case of you both felt the beat in the same spot like it was yeah i mean i'm just curious as a drummer like yes there's certain bass players like yeah that, that you that you just immediately lock with and others that you sometimes fight with because maybe and yeah. you guys were just hearing it in the same spot right i mean exactly and it was effortless from, from yeah. the first uh, from the beginning you know but when i say he taught me so much about it i mean he just opened my mind to to uh i mean i'd always thought compositionally i i i tried to when creating you know rhythm tracks for songs but he was such a master at it i mean and just just knew I and mean, there's some stuff we did with gary wright that i'm so proud of i just listened to the other day uh the, a song called close to you where it's george yeah. and i on it and it just really exemplifies that thing it's like we intuitively knew each other so well that he knew when I was going to say something on the drums and he would not get in the way and vice versa, you know, and we'd just yeah. like answer each other. And it was just so easy, man, you know, as well as that thing, Johnny, that you're talking about that. Yeah. So magical yeah. When you agree on, on, you know, where to put it, not where to put it, ahead, yeah. not, not, so, or maybe both. But at the same time, you feel like doing that. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And th those are magical moments. I know it, it doesn't, for me anyway, it doesn't happen all with everybody. But it's 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 so special when it does. And and uh, yeah, what that, that's great, man. And and so and the song you just mentioned by Gary Wright, close to you. Are there some other examples of songs that you would kind of tell everybody watching to check out that you're that you feel proud of that you oh god yeah well there's so many that with kenny uh even though we only did let me see it was pretty much three albums together together with kenny i yeah. ended up doing a, a more after george left but the the entire keep the fire album that that to me Boy, that's really a great example of that thing uh, yeah. that we're talking yeah. about. And there's a song on there, Michael Jackson sang background vocals on, if you can believe that. It was wow. after Living Off the Wall. And Michael Brecker does a sax solo. Oh, yeah. It's okay. Called who's Right, Who's Wrong. That's that's one of those for sure. But but the whole album, I think, it's a song called Junk A New Holiday that sounds like you're in the Caribbean kind of that George's murders. And and we both kind of, you know, it feels real good. <laughs> Great. All right. I'm, I'm going to check these out and, and I encourage other people to check them out, too. And yeah. And I, I just saw a note from our friend Eddie Taduri, who's oh, snuck into the broadcast. Hey, good old Eddie. Eddie. He says, Tris, I love every note you've ever played. Thanks for helping me with our trap concert last year. Oh, uh, my God. Man. Eddie. Yeah. Oh, Eddie. Jesus, it's good I, to hear from you, man. I miss you, my brother. <laughs> yeah, he's he's the best. He was just on a couple of weeks ago and uh great guy. Great, oh, great guy. He sure is, man. Amazing human. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And there's there's a, one more question, Tris, from uh, Elizabeth. D'Alessio, De I hope I pronounced her name correctly. Uh -huh. um, and she asks, hey, Tris, at what age did you start playing drums and who were your biggest influences, biggest early influences? Oh, OK. Well, geez, I I don't remember not playing drums, at least knowing that I was going. That's what I had to do. Even though I don't think I got a drum, actually. My folks finally acquiesced after giving me a practice pad, I think, when I <laughs> <laughs> like, like about nine years old or something but they knew i was going to be a drummer and i finally got a snare drum i think of about 10 or 11 uh but as far as influences that's a great question by the way thank you for asking i uh i had an uncle who had uh, was a sailor like way into sailing and uh he uh, was in a race that, to tahiti uh and uh crewed on a boat on this race from from Honolulu to Papeete, Tahiti, and he came back like like singing, you know, speaking French and and Tahitian and playing Tahitian guitar, and he brought oh. me like this my first drum, which was a Toede, which is a hollowed out log, and if you guys are at all familiar with Polynesian music, you know it's. Uh, 
Tahitian drumming uses these and the, the Tahitian girls, you know, with the amazing hips and all. So anyway, I had these couple of albums that, I'm sorry, I'm wandering here, but. No, uh, that was great. One was called Drums of Bora Bora. And the other was just something about Tahiti. And I just listened to them over and over again. And I still, when I'm soloing to this day, I can't escape referencing certain phrases that these Tahitian drummers did. And I, it just How made such that? an impression on me. But but then also, I have to say, my dad was the best dashboard drummer I've ever heard. And he wasn't a drummer, but he was really musical. He had a beautiful voice. And, and uh, man, he was way into jazz, you know. So he we'd listen to the jazz station. And he'd be playing on, you know, on the steering wheel and the dashboard, you know. And he was oh, that's great, badass <laughs> man. And yeah, but but uh, I listened to so many great records that, as a result of my mom, who also played piano, and my dad's love of music. I was exposed early on to, of course, all the big band stuff. You know, they loved and so Gene sure. Krupa and. And, uh, and they were way into Blue Beck and all of that. But then my mom loved Harry Belafonte. So that, you know, <laughs> so so that yeah. Calypso album, you know, I can still, I know note for note. So does my little sister, you know. <laughs> and and uh, uh, but but I always had my ear glued to the radio. And so rock and roll just really hammered me and uh, made a huge impression. But growing up at the beach, I was a, I was a surfer too, and and during like the way early '60s, surf music was a big deal. Instrumental surf music, so yeah. uh, the Ventures, you know, I was influenced by, and uh, you know that goes way back. And I was in surf bands and that. But then it became apparent, you know, you got to sing. So I ended up being the singer in a lot of bands. But believe no it or not, and and I laughing yeah. to say if I could. If I could ever cough up this fur ball, I'll start singing again. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh man, I'm learning a lot. I, I I knew you sang a little bit, but I didn't realize you were like the singer in these in these early bands you're in. That's really cool. I sang lead. Actually, one claim to fame. Uh, I was way into the Rascals during this period, and I I wanted to sing like Felix Cavalieri, right? And so yeah, we all love the Rascals and. And so uh, I, I was in a band, this quartet, that I was a lead singer, and we opened for Stevie Wonder when I was in high school. And, oh, uh, man. And Stevie actually liked us. <laughs> and it was, wow. He talked to me about it. I was like, oh, my God, it's Stevie Wonder, you know, and he likes oh. us. You know, so that was a defining moment in my life. I knew then I must have been about 15. Uh, 16 I said yeah yeah I'm going for it this is what I need to do so yeah, yeah. I mean seriously uh, you know talk about something that's like a you know an affirmation of of your dream right there yeah that he <laughs> he recognized it yeah wow yeah what, what a, oh man I have told that story to many people it's really you know but now I, yeah, I mean, it just seems so unbelievable to me still, but, but that happened. And so, yeah. So anyway, what a gift, you know, well, and, and what, what you said, Tristan, about your influences makes perfect sense to me having followed your career because you, you have so much swing in your playing, like you can, you, you can lay it down and play like a solid rock groove when you have to do that. But you got, you got a really natural swing and you can't, Take it from a guy who grew up playing rock music. You, can't, it's not easy to develop that if you if if you don't do it when you're young. You know what I mean? It's yeah, it's yeah. uh, well, that's you had the the right blend of all that music kind of just oh. in the pot, so to speak. You know, that's man, great. thank you. Yeah, well, geez, you know, I I really am grateful to my mom and dad for having such eclectic tastes you know yeah. say they listen to classical music too you know and and my mom was totally like like way into the beatles as well you know when they when they came yeah they came out and in fact i got to see the beatles live i was we were just my wife and i talking about uh that this morning on the second tour at the hollywood bowl and uh 
and, and you know the passing of David Crosby is what brought the conversation about. Uh, you know, he was a friend of mine, and that, and I had the honor of recording with CSNN. But but my first encounter with David Crosby, I'll never forget, and I got to tell him about. I was at the Beatles concert, second con uh, second tour at the Hollywood Bowl with my sister and my mom, and I had a seat on the aisle, and I had recognized the birds behind us and oh, i love birds too yeah yeah and and i knew they were there but like once the beatles started playing and all bedlam had gone it was crazy i mean you could barely hear them it was a, a girl that jumped in the fountain in front of the stage and everything <laughs> but, but, yeah. anyway somehow the birds hadn't been recognized but got recognized and they had to split like really fast so uh so david crosby had his cape on and everything <laughs> oh and it man came running and hit me and knocked me out in the aisle right and so <laughs> later on i got to go you know what you did to me i don't know if you remember <laughs> of course you couldn't remember <laughs> knocking me out but he remembers <laughs> having oh. to split real fast he remembered it so <laughs> oh that's great man yeah yeah <laughs> the first time we met you knocked me over yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i was always oh. knocked over by you yeah yeah man yeah. Oh. and sing and, and, uh, and uh, you know i i saw that really heartwarming post you made about david and i'm i'm so sorry and and you know we're but we're we're all sorry but man again what a what a blessing that you got to work with him and and you knew him and oh absolutely uh, yeah man. yeah that's what a talent oh my god man yeah. I know. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Well, he 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 left some just, you know, music that that will live on forever and and yeah. we'll just be thankful for that, you know. Absolutely. Well, yeah. 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 Well, Tris, as we as we start to wrap things up, any anything you want to talk about? I know we talked about um you're working you've been working lately doing some some tunes for Firefall and Yeah. You're you're in Florida now and yeah. Getting adjusted to the East Coast. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a studio, a great studio, but like not, uh, but 15 minutes or, or a little more from my house here. And so uh, I'm really great. happy to do it. Discovered that. And they uh, great, great engineers, great equipment. They have a great set of DWs there that sounds amazing. And uh, so it's like butter. I show up with my symbols and my pedals, you know. <laughs> perfect man yeah yeah. It's great. yeah so yeah but i do i would like to mention that i have this band that i started uh it, do we have enough time absolutely yeah okay. we have all the time you need yeah okay yeah right before the pandemic uh greg bissonette my good friend i brought oh, i love yeah. him so much uh i had called to tell him that you know we had gotten tickets to go see ringo and see him with ringo and, you know, I knew so many people in the band and stuff, too. Uh, but but I wanted to let him know and ask if we if it would be OK, if we could, you know, come back and say hello. And uh, he said, oh, man, he said, God, if I'd have known, you know, of course. And and uh, so so he set all that up. And then uh, I get a phone call. I was taking a nap. You know, I have to do that in my old age here now. <laughs> Me, too. <laughs> <laughs> And and uh, and it was Greg, and he said, "Listen, man, I don't want to say anything, but uh, I I mean for sure, I can't promise, but there's a good chance you're going to sit in tonight on Ringo's drums, and we'll play double drums." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> and he said, "Yeah, yeah." And, and so he said, "Check out." He said, "Give peace a chance," and and uh, with a little help from my with friends, a little help from my friends. And because uh, we do it as an encore in, in a medley anyway. Yeah. And uh, and so I went, oh, OK. So Mary, my wife, drove to the casino and and I'm with headphones, trying to, you know, like shed all this stuff. And uh, anyway, long story short, I got to play Ringo's drums. Oh, my that. God. That was oh. so much fun. And Luke came over and everybody, you know, and I got Hamish Stewart and uh, Colin Hay. And oh, man, it was so much fun, man. So anyway, on the oh. way home, Mary, because that was the year, actually, or just prior to that, 
uh, we'd played two nights at the Hollywood Bowl when I had gone back to, to Kenny Loggins with Michael McDonald, Kenny, and Christopher Cross. And it was completely sold out. You know, oh, yeah. Thousands of people both nights. And, there, and uh, you know, I knew of Yacht Rock because I'd seen the, the YouTube uh, you know skits and stuff and you know, yeah. they were funny but i had no idea you that that in fact yacht rock had become the, this thing right yeah and we played the hollywood bowl and there were all these people running around with yacht garb on and so anyway my mary fast forward to after the ringo show says you know with all the records you played on and with all the people you know in the in the yacht rock genre you could put something together like Ringo, only kind of a yacht thing. And I went, God, that's a kind of a neat idea. So, great idea. Yeah, so I started making some calls and everybody I talked to went, that sounds great, I'm in. So, <laughs> so Awesome. Yeah, so anyway, the pandemic hit and kind of put a big apostrophe in it. But now we have this band, Tris and Bowden Yacht Stars. And and uh, we've got the blessing of, of Kenny and Michael McDonald. I sent them our sizzle reel and they both loved it. So I was like, God, thank you. Oh, man. And, uh, oh that's, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's all right. So, so anyway, we've only done three shows, but the, all three have sold out. And, and the band, they're great, great players. I've got Michael Paulo, the famous Michael Paulo from the jazz world. I mean, he was with yeah. Jero for years and years and then ended up you know playing on miles's last album too but he also played with with james ingram and all kinds of of, of people and uh christopher cross coincidentally so uh, so that's the 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 criteria of the band is we'll only play songs that we played on the record or at at the very least we played on stage with the very artists that were performing their songs so so that casts this huge net. I mean, everybody yeah. from Hall and Oates to Boss Skaggs. I've got Boss Skaggs as a former guitar player who was also with McDonald and Bruce Bollinger is his name. And Monty Seward, this incredible, like uh, uh, he was a staffer at Quincy Jones. Is, uh, you know, uh, he was a staff writer and producer and he's worked with everybody you can imagine from Philip Bailey to... Oh, Howard Hewitt, which I had also heard. So anyway, yeah, just great, great, great guys, and I'm real proud of it. So that's congratulations, Tris. I had seen something about this. I didn't, but I didn't admit that I didn't know what the particulars were. And this is this is what a great, great idea. All you know, great job, Mary. Of course, yeah. Leave it to, yeah. leave it to the wife to come up with the great idea. You know, and <laughs> yes. oh man, I love it. And you know, it's so that's such a timely uh idea too because as as you say you know there's a whole genre dedicated on like satellite radio and yeah and I'll, i yeah i i can't change the channel you know when i'm when i'm sitting around just wanting to groove to some music it's like there's boss skaggs there's christopher cross there's kenny loggins there's you know yeah, yeah. kind of the, all the stuff i love too it just happened yeah. up, even if i didn't play on that stuff i would <laughs> be the stuff i gravitate to i think so Absolutely. I got to tell you a quick Greg Bissonette story oh, that involves you. And and you might remember this. This would have been, gosh, 20 years ago, Greg and I were out like on a clinic tour. Uh -huh. You made me think of this when you said Greg, because you said he's your good buddy. So we're out on a clinic tour and we're like in Seattle or someplace. Mm -hmm. And we get on the, the shuttle bus to go from the hotel to the airport off to the next city. And I either I had a bag or Greg had a bag that said Zildjian. And the guy driving the bus, shuttle bus says, are you guys drummers? And I said, well, my friend here's a drummer, he, Greg Bissonette. Um, might not have been playing with Ringo at the time. I, I said, he used to play with David Lee Roth or something. Uh -huh. And he was moderately impressed. And he said, have you ever heard of Tris and Bowden? Oh. Honest to God, Tris. Yeah. I, and we both looked at each other and we went, he's like one of our best friends. <laughs> he's like, well, He's like the best drummer I, I know. He plays in Chicago. Oh, and we're like, we, and, we're, and we're like, like, we're trying to make him believe that we knew you. Like he wasn't really believing that we'd. So oh. Greg says to me, Johnny, you got Trish's number in your phone? I'm like, yeah, sure, I got it. So I, I call you 
and I put you on the speaker and it's your machine. Hey, it's Tris. How you doing? I'm not here. Leave me a message. And we left you a message. And then I think you called us the next day or later that day. Oh but, man. Yes. I remember yeah, that. Now. Yeah. God. And Greg, Greg would totally remember. Cause we, cause he's like talking and I'm talking. We probably left you a six minute message or something. I and, love that. Oh my yeah, God. I'm yeah. just so sorry. I didn't, I, I didn't pick up. I didn't, I didn't, you know, it's one of those moments, rare moments, where my phone was elsewhere. I think <laughs> you were probably surfing. You, 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 you might have been either playing a gig or surfing. Who knows? Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but anyway, this it imp yeah it impressed this guy because he's like, well, I, I think he like saw your name on the phone and oh. come up and actually your your you know your message and he's like, oh, I guess you really do know. I'm like, yeah, we know him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Uh, but you know and that that's our our brother greg i mean he's just like always oh. you know always wanting to make people happy i you know? know it and yeah. he's so generous yeah. with his time and and with his spirit you know i just love that guy god me too absolutely. me too what a great and, guy. and we both love you oh man well i love you both too i'm telling you what this is so much fun man i'm telling you getting a getting a chance to catch up and 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 uh, as they say in hawaii talk story a little <laughs> <laughs> likewise buddy thank you so much for doing this today it's been so great having you here and and uh, i yeah thank you and i want to thank everybody for watching and please give a big hand for my buddy tristan bowden oh, legendary thank you god yeah thank you all for for coming <laughs> all right